Welcome to my critical let's play videos of the Modern Warfare series. Um, right, so in these videos what I'm going to do is play through the Modern Warfare trilogy. Um, for now, just obviously the first game. And if that turns out to be interesting, I'll play all of them. And what I really want to do is try to figure out We'll try to kind of show why I find these games so interesting, um, despite being the most conventional, conservative, problematic kind of video games, AAA video games for art, the way they kind of uh, signal everything that's wrong with the video games, as they currently are, apparently. So what I want, but there's so much in these games that I find really interesting. So what I want to do is play through them, like kind of on a moment to moment, scale I find lots of stuff really interesting about them so I want to play through them and kind of just point out the things I find interesting because they are kind of these general these really specific moment-to-moment -moment things they're not broad kind of ways that it deals with themes or anything because those aren't particularly exciting um, what I normally say is it's for storytelling I find interesting about these games not for stories um, so it's really quite a purely formal kind of interest I have in them um, so in this video I think what I'll do is probably this tutorial mission and the kind of opening cinematic thing maybe more I'll see how they go I don't want to make them too long um, so while I'm doing this level what I'll do is kind of talk about I guess the mechanics of a game which I should probably do as a kind of intro though they kind of stay the same throughout the game um, so you have this kind of very straightforward shooter thing kind of post halo you know two guns recharging health all that separate button for grenade kind of for way console shooters work after halo um but modern warfare also kind of normalized a few other things as well like obviously the um iron sights you know not really being able to hit anything unless you use your iron sights no i do not want to reverse my controls And obviously you can run over go, but you're going to be less accurate, so quite conventional stuff. Um, a nice little thing that not enough other games kind of copy is being able to shoot through walls. It's always kind of enjoyable, and I'm sure we'll see that as these videos go on, kind of actually have a say in the kind of battles we do. This is something I particularly like, which I wish more console games did. It's like probably the most elegant form of auto-aim. Um, the kind of, no auto-aim at all until you go down your sights and then it automatically snaps onto a nearby enemy. Um, so that gives the, um, it gives a lot of the skirmishes during the single player. It's really kind of nice pacing where you can kind of like pop up and shoot and pop down again. Um, you can kind of like do your kind of blind cover fire and kind of be sure you're going to hit something. Now switch to your rifle. Now pull out your sidearm. Remember, switching to your pistol is always faster than reloading. Using your knife is even faster than switching. To um, so of course, like Halo, you have your kind of other button for melee, uh, which is the best thing Halo probably did for console shooters, is that one button for one action kind of thing, as opposed to since you don't have a number pad or a mouse wheel to quickly swap between things. I don't think people really appreciate um, how playable that made first person shooters on a console. Alright, I meant to destroy the watermelon. I also really like the fact that pistols, if you choose to carry a pistol, you can choose to carry two rocket launchers if you want. But pistols have that kind of fastness to get out in a moment, which again, kind of contributes to a lot of the game's kind of cinematicness. Um, which is something else I should talk about while we're doing this kind of um, tutorial mission. Oh, that was front button. I've been playing my Nintendo way too much where cancels okay and okay is cancel. Um, so while the Modern Warfare has kind of very much became their own thing with Modern Warfare 2 and Modern Warfare 3 kind of losing the Call of Duty 4 moniker, um, you know, when this game came out in, what, 2007, I think, it was still very much the next Call of Duty after a series of World War II and Vietnam War kind of Call of Duties. Um, and I find it really interesting to think about how 
the design of this game is kind of working within the limitations of a of genre conventions kind of set around this kind of turn of a millennium world war two game kind of idea there's people over there um i don't know you could come over here i'm just kind of wasting time never really looked around oh, and you're not even american when this starts the jingoism doesn't really come in until later um but so so from um so the old Call of Duty, so I remember seeing the boxes in um, computer stores. The whole point of them was that, you know, this idea that a war isn't won by a hero, but by multiple men, still very much men kind of thing. Um, and it kind of tried to show this, I guess, global network of war in World War II by swapping you between characters, a Soviet soldier, then a British soldier, then an American soldier, to try to, I guess, give a appreciation of the Allied forces across you know, not just in one battle. Um, and of course it came out at a time when there was lots of kind of cinematic World War II movies happening and you saw a lot of cinematic World War II games coming out at the same time. Um, like Middle of Honor, Allied Assault, with it, cinematic beach landing, college, half or early kind of Call of Duty 2 levels you can trace to one movie or another. Um, so then you have the Modern Warfares, which kind of, very much modern day obviously not world war ii um trying to kind of glorify modern day technology like that's its big kind of draw card you don't have a single shot thing you have this massive assault rifle now you have night vision like the sound of night vision is kind of the mascot sound for the games um so you get this weird kind of world war ii 2001 kind of game design ideas mashing with this wanting to tell a cinematic post 9-11 war on terror, terror kind of story um, and that'll be something interesting we'll see as the game goes on right what the hell kind of name is soap eh? how a muppet like you pass selection so it's your turn for the cqb test everyone else head to observation for this test so at this point characters are really nobodies we've got captain soap here sorry captain price who turns out to be a very important character as the trilogy goes on uh, and is the character you end up playing ultimately at the end of the game at the end of a trilogy uh, the character I'm playing currently faceless and uh, voiceless is Soap you don't actually see Soap at all in this game but he becomes a important side character in the next two games as you play someone else um, so I'll just do this tutorial quickly pick up that mp5 and four flashbangs I really can't, like, I'm sure it matters in multiplayer, which I never play, but all the machine guns really seem the same to me. After that, you will storm down the stairs to position two, then hit position three and four, following my precise instructions at each position. Grab the rope when you're ready. Go, go, go! So the tutorial is really teaching how it wants you to play the game. It wants you to kind of move through and whoop, wrong button. I really like how flashbangs work in this game. I'm gonna be too distracted talking to probably play well. Flashbang through the door. Final position, go. Where am I going? Sprint to the finish. Pretty good soap, but I've seen better. Climb up the ladder if you want another go. You can do that as many times as you want. I don't particularly want to. We might as well move on and do something interesting. The cargo ship mission is a go. Get yourself sorted out. Wheels up at 0200. Dismissed. I'm just going to play for a regular at this point. Um. I think something I found interesting about these games 
I guess the first time I played them. I didn't play them until they'd been out for quite a few years. Um, was that as I started, I was just like, all right, I'm doing kind of generic military mission one, generic military mission two. And it probably wasn't until I was about maybe halfway through that I realized it was actually a story I was engaged with unfolding. A very conventional, generic, Tom Clancy-ish kind of story, but a story nonetheless. Um, about it actually tells it quite interestingly. So in this mission, I think you see kind of a prime di way that it's trying to differentiate itself from the previous Call of Duties. It's not a massive World War II battlefield of hundreds versus hundreds. It's, um, you know, one kind of small squad of elite soldiers versus, you know, kind of sneaking into a boat and just trying to get information. And of course that kind of facade disappears quite quickly and it kind of goes back to a World War II style very quickly. I found that very shocking straight away, this kind of shooting soldiers in their beds thing. Um, it's either gross because it's just saying, oh, you know, these people are badasses, they won't even, they'll shoot people in their beds, who cares. Um, I always found it kind of, I guess, shocking and grim. Um, there's kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say it's moral ambiguity, ambiguity, I don't think the game's quite that profound or anything, but I always found it quite, it was affronting, realising this isn't just good guys versus bad guys, like, if you're playing as people who don't mind shooting people in their beds. This mission, right from the very start, I really like this kind of sense of a body that you have. Um, like, for where you can just kind of see the boat swinging back and forward there. Um, and later when the ship is sinking while you're trying to escape, um, you can kind of really feel the kind of tiltiness of it, which I really appreciate. Where that helicopter just machine gunned everyone in there, you kind of already see the um, elite squat team infiltration kind of facade disappearing for the kind of old-fashioned just machine gunning. I like to keep this for close encounters. Too right, mate. On my mark, go. Check your corners. I will be talking about narrative and what's going on when stuff actually happens. At this point, really, at least for the first time I was playing, it's nothing interesting was happening. It was just some generic military mission, so let's approach it like that for now. Right. Something else worth mentioning at this stage, and we'll see especially in the kind of tutorial, not the tutorial, sorry, the cinematic. Um, the next level um, is something I find interesting about how these games deal with agency. Um, you know, these games get a lot of slack for uh, not giving the players any choices, for just being super linear, like exactly the same every time you play. Um, I guess I kind of get that criticism because people like games with choices, I guess, but what I find, what I really appreciate about these games is if you're willing to do exactly what you're told, they kind of play out like an action movie. Um, it's very much a game where you, you are performing a character and you have a script and you need to follow that script. And if you follow that script, you get to be part of a cool action movie and if you don't follow that script, it'll just fall to pieces. So it's the kind of game you have to do what you're told in order to appreciate it, um, which, with its military, along with its military themes, and that is certainly something worthy of criticism by a lot of people, because maybe murdering lots of people isn't something you should be doing uncritically. Um, So you still gotta go for boat lurching back and forward here, like right from the very start mich first mission you've you've kinda of got some kind of environmental augmenting messing of the kind of core mechanics. Um, though I say that but these aren't particularly interesting skirmishes on this mission. Forward area 
area clear. Move! Clear left. Clear right. Stack up. Stand by. On my go. One ready. Two ready. So I guess the desire of what this kind of mission is trying to do from the start is make you feel like you're part of an elite group, you know, you kind of got all your kind of rubbishy jargon as well, your kind of kids on the playground, like, on my mark, go, or whatever. Um, that's all super tacky, but um, it's kind of fun to pretend, I guess, in a really juvenile, boys playing war kind of ways, which is all it is. But it does that well. Um, I also particularly like that you're never kind of, or well, rarely, except for a few missions, feel like the only person being shot at. There's constantly um, other enemies shooting other allies. Um, it always feels like there's a lot going on, um, that you're kind of, that you don't matter, I guess. And you don't matter, you know, in the game design either. It's like being super linear and already told for you in a lot of ways, predetermined for you in a lot of ways. But I kind of really appreciate that it's kind of stuck with that you're not a hero, you're just one soldier kind of thing um, in a lot of ways that it doesn't stop for you. But then that kind of conflicts weirdly with this story of a small squad of heroes thing that happened. Shock horror, we found a nuclear missile, I guess. Ready to secure package for transport. No time, Bravo 6. Two bogeys headed your way fast. Grab what you can and get the hell out of there. Fast movers. Probably mix. We better go. So, grab the manifest in the container. Move! Alright, everyone topside. Double time. Alright, so enemy jets are coming to blow shit up, so we need to escape quickly. Warcraft Griffin, what's your status? Already in the helicopter, sir! Enemy aircraft! <laughs> So you've already got the kind of level pacing that happens throughout the game, the games rather, um, to kind of sneak your way in, shoot a lot of people and then massive cinematic exit um, and you'll see that repeated over and over. I always find myself kind of unconsciously tilting my head on this part as the ship kind of lurches. Um, I think it's just done very well, it's like, and these hallways that like you kind of need to feel it in the controller, like, I know that is straight ahead now. Um, like, that's forward, and it just kind of feels really weird. It might be hard to convey in a video without controlling it. Um, if you've played it, oh my god. If you've played it, you might understand, but... Oh my god, oh, I got distracted. It's almost like no matter how <laughs> whoops, no matter how many times I play it, I always find it kind of nauseating and... To the right, I should have been listening. God, they can't run. No, I just find myself like turning in the wrong direction because it's just my body doesn't connect with the world. I find it very interesting. Pretty sure I can't sprint for some reason. And of course, every jump is a near miss. Every explosion is a near miss. It's all very Michael Bay. So this is your introduction to the game, I guess. Um, this is the pre-credits part. But now we get to a part where the kind of, yeah, the Infinity Ward presents, credits happen. Um, and I find this level super interesting that we're about to see uh, the intro credits. And it's very much just the Half-Life train ride that so many Linnaeus um, story-based shooters kind of follow. They're kind of, you do a drive somewhere. Um, before that, we go back to the loading screen, this kind of top-down network of war, kind of global surveillance thing. And this kind of eye in the sky kind of finds a different character. So we've played Soap for two levels, and suddenly we're pulled out of Soap 
pulled up into the sky, then like thrown back down into someone else's body, quite literally thrown into their body, as will happen at the end of this cutscene. Uh, and at the end of this level, that body we're thrown into will be killed. Um, so this kind of opening level we'll see summed up everything really I find so interesting about the modern warfare games that I wish other more interesting games that are telling more interesting stories would follow. So here's our character's body. We just see he's the president. I missed his name, but he's the president of the country. And now we're in him, looking through him at this world. Um, so we've kind of got the, I guess, again, the half-life mode of storytelling here that like, how can we tell a story restricted to a character's body um, and Half-Life did that by telling a very specific story of Gordon Freeman moving across a landscape. Um, so what the modern warfare's want to do, if they want to do that same kind of always in the body of a character, restricted kind of embodied storytelling, but they want to tell this kind of global networked war kind of action movie story. So the way they kind of combine those together is by just throwing you from one character to the next, which this does really well, so they'll just throw you into a character you've never seen before, you don't know anything about them, but you just kind of have to take them up, um, like the actor you are in these games. Um, the first time they do this, they restrict you to the backseat of a car, you've clearly been kidnapped. This guy in a jumpsuit will find out as a proper character later on, who will find that out through soap and other characters. Um, but essentially the, char the country you're the president of, which is a super stereotypic, problematically so, just Middle Eastern country that doesn't actually exist. Is being, has some kind of military coup happening and you're being taken out. So I kind of like this, like, you know enough about your character, that is, they're the president of this country, to know that you're watching this country fall apart from their eyes. And it gives you as the player this kind of... Um, idea of what's happening in this game without the need for exposition. Um, I know a lot of people who would call something like this essentially a cutscene, like I'd call the opening train ride of Half-Life essentially a cutscene. Um, and I find that incredibly reductive because right now I'm moving the right analog stick around and I'm, I'm choosing my character looks. I'm very much embodied in a character's body right now. I'm choosing to look at the action. I could just look at my feet if I wanted to. Um, and that's not a cutscene. I have a real kind of bodily engagement with this right now. The fact I can't walk or shoot anything or make a choice doesn't stop that. Um, and really that will boil down to what I find most interesting about storytelling in these games. Um, just that kind of confidence to throw you from one character to another um, and just assume the player will take up that character, that character's interests, that character's concerns and not be like, I can't do this because they're opposed to my previous character. Uh, it kind of goes against the presumed understanding of how player character relationships work. Um, I really enjoy that about it and we'll see that kind of again and again as the games go on. Most interestingly when you, they kind of start mucking around with time as well and you're one character watching what you did as another character in another game do, and that gets really interesting as well. Um, but for now we just simply have a character who is not so, who I can't really control, who's really really subservient right now, just being dragged around. Which goes back to what I was saying about agency earlier in these games. Um, you're never really in charge in these games, there's very few missions where you're not following a superior officer or you're not being dragged by people who are holding you captive, as in this case. Um, there's very few moments where your character is in a position where they have to make choices for themselves, um, which I like in that it kind of ties in with what the players do. The player's not never doing what they want to do either. They're all constantly just being told what to do. So that character who just looked at me in the eyes will find out later is kind of the main big bad guy. Um, but Soap and all them don't really find out he's even alive for quite a while. Um, so that guy on the right talking to the camera is kind of who you think is the main bad guy is. But the person passing the gun you find out later is the real bad guy. 
I guess the guy on the right is Shinra, the guy on the left is Sephiroth, essentially. Um, and here, like what, 20 minutes into the game, um, the player gets killed. Um, if a player will get killed, I think twice in this game, and maybe six or seven times throughout the series. Um, so I really like this as an upfront. This is how the game works. And it's too late to do anything for all Falani. But in less than three hours, code name Nikolai will be executed. Nikolai, sir. So that's kind of a contextualizing something's happening over there. But for British SAS that I'm controlling and more interested over somewhere else in some generic Russia kind of problem where um, our informant Nikolai has been kidnapped and we're going to go save him. So eventually this all kind of converges with different characters and different places, but for now what we've really got is just this kind of idea of how storytelling works in this game. You'll be thrown between characters, you won't really have much say in what those characters do, you'll be following orders, and sometimes those characters will be killed and there's nothing you can do about that. So you either follow orders and go along with it, or you just don't enjoy the game, essentially. Um, and that really fits into the kind of way the earlier games just kept swapping characters in order to show you these multiple battlefields of World War II. So that's really all I want to say for this kind of first video. Um, I'll come back and keep playing this level in the next video. That gives us a kind of overarching what I find interesting about these games. And we'll kind of see that in a moment-to-moment -moment, um, way as I keep going.